Uh, I think uh, most of you uh, already know me. If you don't, you can look me up on Twitter where I share annoying and toxic things. I think I will have a website ready finally after many, many years because I need a website to, to share some stuff. So maybe in two weeks it will be ready. Right now it's not. And uh, let's start with the argument, which is uh, scarcity and Bitcoin. So first of all, a very short disclaimer. This is a very loaded term. And yes, it has a lot of different meanings in uh, common conversation and in economics and in physics. The common uses uh, are definitely confusing and we will see a little bit of examples, uh, some examples. The physical definition is uh, maybe more simple, but it's full of surprises uh, that you will see and maybe it's not as useful as you could imagine. And also the traditional economical definition uh, has some ambiguities. It, I mean, it, has, it is clear, but uh, in the most clear version, I think it's not very, very useful. And uh, you can find a few examples of discussion about the usefulness of this classical definition when I love to trigger Eric Vosquil on uh, Twitter. Uh, Eric, Eric is my uh, favorite uh, uh, terminology Nazi on there. And, um, and we like to trigger each other about definitions. It is better than mere definitions, but I, I still think that there are some, uh, uh, it's not fully useful the way scarcity is discussed in, in traditional economics. Also with Bitcoin, we already know that many of the, uh, of the that most of the uh, framework used in traditional economy, economics is not as relevant as before because it's, uh, uh, now we have a different example of an economic asset, an economic kind of property, which is challenging in many, many ways. So uh, first of all, let's follow the standard. Let's follow, do not invent anything. And let's follow the discussion about Bitcoin scarcity that many, many of you will probably already uh, have read in uh, the book by Sefidiana Moose, The Bitcoin Standard. So uh, the Bitcoin Standard discusses uh, uh, Austrian economics for many, many chapters. And then in the last few chapters, it discusses Bitcoin. And uh, when uh, uh, Sefidiana has to relate uh, Bitcoin with scarcity, basically he, uh, he, 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 uh, he discusses two main things. The first thing is that Bitcoin is the first real example of scarcity in the digital realm or in the realm of the information. Of course, uh, we can have a scarce physical object, but information is never scarce because you can always copy it, you can always replicate it. And uh, Bitcoin is the first, uh, quote unquote, I will challenge this definition a little bit, but it's safe to say this first real or uh, useful enough example of uh, digital scarcity or informational scarcity. And the second sentence is that Bitcoin is the first example of absolute scarcity, which is something that Daniel was already hinting at in the, his introduction, which is something which is very difficult, uh, different from uh, relative scarcity. Let's uh, take a very quick look to Saifedian's words. So the first thing that he says in, in the book at page uh, 177 is, with this te technological design, Nakamoto was able to invent digital scarcity. Bitcoin is the first example of digital good that is scarce and cannot be reproduced indefinitely or infinitely in this case. While it's trivial to send a digital object from one location to another in a digital network, as is done with email, text messaging or file downloads, it's more accurate to describe this process as copying rather than sending because the digital object remain with the sender and can be reproduced infinitely. Bitcoin is the first example of digital good whose transfer stops it from being owned by the sender. So when I send it to you, I don't have it anymore. Of course, he also says that beyond digital scarcity, Bitcoin is also the first example of absolute scarcity. The only liquid commodity, digital or physical, with a set fixed quantity that cannot conceivably be increased. Until the invention of Bitcoin, scarcity was always relative, never absolute. It is common misconception to imagine that any physical good is, is finite, finite or absolutely scarce because the limit on the quantity we can produce of any good is never its prevalence in the planet or in the universe, but the effort and time dedicated to producing it. So with its absolute scarcity, Bitcoin is highly scalable across time. Uh, so uh, this gets discussed again. Uh, the many readers understood intuitively th this point, but uh, this point clashes a little bit with some subtleties, with some uh, nuances of a, a naive definition. So 
what is scarce? Scarce is something that uh, is, that comes in a limited quantity, uh, maybe in a, in a few pieces, in a few instances, and in a few exemplars. So there is not much of it. There is a, there is a, there is a, there is less than we want of it. So something is scarce. The problem with this naive definition that we use in common language is that uh, well, we have basically have two problems. The first problem is that physically speaking. Uh, this sentence will, will appear a little bit strange, but I will try to show you that it's true. Everything, literally everything, is scarce if we use the most naive definition. Uh, and when I say everything, uh, yes, I also include the digital information. Uh, there are trivial examples that for uh, uh, scarce digital information that I will not use here because I want to go deeper. The trivial examples are, for example, secrets you can trade, you can exchange secrets because even if uh, when I tell you a secret, you have a copy and I still have my copy for the first, uh, let's say that secrets are an ephemeral example of scarcity because the more the secret spreads, the less scarce it is in a very naive sense. But especially at the beginning, when the secret is not public by definition, uh, it has a value of scarcity because few people knows it. But this cannot be used for, for example, in a monetary system because it loses its scarcity pretty, pretty fast. Basically, it propagates uh, with a very high inflation rate. And then there is another example of uh, scarcity of digital information, which is trivial, which are, for example, uh, patents. So uh, fake fiat scarcity, which is uh, not really natural, but it is uh, imposed with violence. For example, I create, I, I write a book and I will send uh, armed cops to beat you up if you uh, reproduce my book. So if you reproduce my, my I, I come to your home, I whistle a song. And if you also whistle the song, I will send somebody to, uh, to basically to hurt you. So this is the state-based, government-based artificial scarcity. We, for example, patents law and copyright laws. And this is not very, this is not great as well because Maybe you can maintain it for some time, but basically it's negative sum game. Uh, you don't create uh, uh, wealth. Uh, you don't create uh, uh, anything. We just destroy stuff. Any anytime you you send somebody to or somebody else to create some kind of artificial uh, economical interactive interaction, which is not voluntary, instead of having multiplication of wealth, you basically have negative sum and destruction of wealth because now. Uh, the people, the victim will have to uh, spend some money defending itself from my aggression and so on and so on. But there is, these are trivial examples of digital information that are scarce, artificially scarce or temporarily scarce via secret. A deeper example, I will use uh, 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 the mathematician Norman J. Wildberg as an example. I'm sure that many, many other people represented the same problem. But uh, I think that the way Norman represents it is very, very funny. So I, I suggest you to look it up on YouTube. You can find the video. The video, you can find the title uh, in the bottom of the screen. The, the title of the video is Numbers, the Universe, and Complexity Beyond Us. And it's a part of his uh, free course of uh, data structures and math foundations. And it's, it's pretty, I think it's one of the most simple examples of what I want to share with you right now, it's, it's very well done. So the first question then uh, that this mathematician asks is, uh, how big is the universe? Of course, we can also assume that the universe is infinite or there are infinite universe, but at least assuming the, uh, the fact that the speed of light uh, is uh, something we cannot, uh, uh, is like a hard limit. So how big is the, uh, uh, the, the, the universe that we can observe, the observable universe? And the obs observable universe, uh, so if we consider the speed of light, is basically in the most, uh, uh, let's say, in the most uh, uh, optimistic uh, in terms of uh, expansion scenarios, is about uh, 10 to the 30 meters. So it's not that much. A cube, uh, to simplify, uh, the universe, the observable universe is contained in a cube of 10 to the 30 meters. Maybe there is something beyond that, but we cannot look at it. So what is another question that you will, may think is completely unrelated is how can we, how, how small can we make a thing? And now it's uh, now uh, basically quantum mechanics uh, weights in 
and now there is the point of uh, Planck scale. Planck scale is the uh, most uh, uh, sm the smallest, most uh, uh, short kind of distance we can do. Basically, a cube which is uh, 10 to the to, to the minus 35 uh, meter is a, 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 a dim dimension under which we cannot go anymore because then we have uh, basically uncertainty principle uh, kicking in and making the concept of distance uh, basically undefined anymore. So there is not there is nothing which is bigger than a cube which is 10 to the 30 meters of uh, of a side, and there is nothing which is smaller by definition of a cube which has uh, 10 to the minus 35 meters. So the, the next question that he asked is, okay, how many cubes of, uh, uh, we, how many uh, cubes, the smallest kind of cube that you can do can fit in the biggest estimation for the observable universe? So basically you have to multiply uh, 10 to the 35. Well, basically the, the, I, I give you the results directly. There are about 10 to the 200 Planck cubes inside the observable universe. So the question that uh, that uh, this mathematician asks is, okay, if we assume that we are good enough to create a hard drive, which is as big as the observable universe, of course, that's a little bit too big, too big. but if we assume that we can create something big enough and we can use uh, uh, the cells, the, the cluster of the hard drive so small that they are just the smallest thing that you can ever have, then you can at, at best write down uh, if you assume, uh, for example, hexadecimal number, so uh, your base is 16, you can basically create 16 to the 10 to the 200, which is less than basically the 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the third. So it's something which is smaller than the number 10, 10 titration 4. The titration is basically the, the, the hyper, hyper operation of, uh, of, uh, of exponential. So you take 10 to the 10, to the 10, to the 10, four times. This is the titration of 10. And we cannot write numbers uh, after this limit, even if we add all the universe for, uh, for, our, for us just as an R drive. So it's completely impossible to write down these numbers. So even if we think like the numbers are, natural numbers are infinite, they are not. Uh, in the universe, there are actually, everything is scarce and there is a, a limited supply in general of literally everything. So it's clear that this definition of scarce, something that uh, in our physical universe cannot uh, be produced uh, over some certain limit is uh, a little bit useless because literally everything, including information, including numbers are actually limited in our physical universe. Of course, you could exclude uh, something like uh, platonic ideas. Maybe you can say that, yes, uh, we will never be able to write a number which goes beyond uh, 10 to titration four. Uh, I mean, of course, you can write down 10 to 4 plus 1, but then when you want to go, do, to go over significantly, for example, to do addition and to do algebra, you cannot do that anymore. We can, but we can say that maybe the idea, the platonic ideas of numbers are there, even if you, we, we cannot write it down. For example, this mathematician is using this argument because he is opposed to the infinite uh, concept in, uh, in, uh, in modern set theory. And, uh, and so he is he, one of the th people joining the constructivist, intuitivist, uh, uh, finitism uh, idea of mathematics. But anyway, you can go a little bit abstract, but physically speaking, everything comes in a, in, in a limited supply. But then even if literally anything comes in a, in a finite supply, in a limited supply, economically speaking and practically speaking, nothing is scarce because uh, the probability that we will ever, uh, ever uh, uh, basically clash against uh, the actual physical limit for most of the things is actually uh, very, very small and close to zero. Uh, uh, the number of private keys that you can do in Bit that you can have in Bitcoin, if you consider Bitcoin uh, private keys as uh, uh, 256 bits, uh, any combination, any permutation of uh, 256 bits, it's a little less uh, actually because uh, for elliptic curves, you cannot use any combination, but let's assume that you can use any combination. That is basically two to the 256. And uh, these are, this is, is the total number, the total supply of private keys that we can use, you can, we can use with elliptic curves. 
uh, they are they are not infinite. There is a limited supply. But the, per, the, the point is that we will never realistically hit this limited supply uh, in any realistic configuration of human civilization across the galaxy in the next uh, trillion of years. So the point is that, yeah, there is a finished supply physically, but economically, we will never touch it. And actually, that's true for basically everything, uh, even things that we can say has a very a smaller limited supply than, than the number of uh, possible combination of natural numbers that we can write down or of uh, configuration of Bitcoin private keys of 256 bytes. Uh, but even stuff like gold, uh, they're actually not really limited in supply. I mean, there is a theoretical limits in supply in the universe, but this is far, far beyond the, the kind of amount that we will ever touch in our realistic expectation for our civilization. So what happened with gold? Uh, gold in a mine, in, in a, I mean, the production of gold uh, in, the, in the gold mines on the crust of the earth, uh, it's limited in theory, but then if the price goes up, you just dig deeper. And uh, we, just, uh, we just touched the uh, infinitesimal part of the earth crust for uh, rare metal and for gold. There are a lot of cases of, uh, of uh, doomsdayers and especially mainstream economists and Keynesians and Marxists, and so other kind of pseudo pseudoscientists uh, saying that we will run out of copper in year uh, 1980. We will run out of uranium. We will run out of stuff. The fact is that we will never run out of stuff because if, the, the, if there is use, if there is demand, the more, the more demand there is, when the supply goes down, the price goes up. If the price goes up, the incentives to just uh, dig deeper goes up, go up as well. And so we just dig deeper. And uh, in, the, in the earth crust, it's not easy to make an estimation of how much gold we are digging up compared to the amount of gold in the, uh, in the whole planet. It's not an easy estimation, but basically it's safe to say that it is way, way, way below uh, one percent of the total gold, but it's way, way, way below that because most of the heavy metals also are not in the crust; they are in the nucleus of the air. So there is way to go before we run out of gold. But also, if we eventually run out of gold on Earth, or if the cost to extract gold from the center of the Earth is not enough, is not high enough to make it uh, basically to make it pro profitable, we just go to mine asteroids uh, at a certain level of price. It, it, get, it becomes pro profitable to just go to mine asteroids. So what if you run out of asteroids? Well, just you, you just create gold. Uh, this is, sounds like something an alchemist uh, will do with a, uh, with a philosopher's stone, but it's actually something that you can do if the price is high enough. You just take a, you just take a heavier uh, kind of element and you just send uh, low velocity neutrons until you, you create some atoms of the, this gold. I mean, it's not very convenient. It's very expensive to do that. But if the price is high enough and if the d demand is high and if the supply uh, from other means is low enough, you just do that. So you can create gold. We don't do that because it's not convenient and we probably never become convenient to just transmutate uh, other metals. But we can if we have to. And for most users, uh, uh, interestingly enough, not monetary uses, and we will talk a little bit about why, but for most cons consumption uses, you can always find good enough substitute goods. So even if you cannot find gold for some jewel, uh, when the demand is other than that, uh, uh, the market will just produce a substitute good, substitute, substitute good, which is good enough to replace gold for that use for uh, electronics, for uh, jewelry, for everything, we will just come out with alternatives. And if there is no space and, uh, anymore for, uh, for uh, rails, we will just uh, produce uh, planes and, and so on and so on. This doesn't work with money, actually, because in the case of money, uh, uh, it's, it's a shelling point and you cannot really replace easily a shelling point because if you could, everybody will move and it will not be a shelling point anymore. I mean, game theory for collectibles and for money and for all that kind of, uh, of uh, property where the scarcity itself is, uh, is basically the, the, the main utility. In, the, in those cases, you cannot find easily substitute goods. But anyway, for most things, including gold, you can. So uh, nothing is economically scarce, uh, nothing, not even gold. 
Of course, there are some exception in this uh, in this case as well. For example, the amount of time that you have is uh, li supply limited supply uh, also practically, not just in theory. Because even if you can expand your life, if you spend enough time in in uh, like uh, life extension technology and so on, uh, I mean, you have some probability that you will just die anyway. But maybe if you spend enough money, you can actually extend your life for a while. Uh, and maybe you can extend the life of the human civilization for a few billion years if you colonize other planets. But eventually, all the physical models that we have of the universe are basically either big crunch, so the universe crash, crunching down, or more likely uh, entropic death of the universe when the entropy is so high and everything just basically uh, thermodynamically dies off. Uh, so it's a finite amount of time that we have to live. It's smaller than the age of the universe, of course. Uh, it will realistically be the time of our life, which is limited. Uh, this is a very deep consideration, but actually there is an, I mean, even if time gets so valuable that there is a, a huge incentive to produce more time, in this case, if we talk about the time of our life, uh, uh, producing more time is becomes basically becoming more productive so that we can free up time that we, for example, we, create a new enterprise that we will free us from a day-to-day -day job. And so we will have more, more time to do other stuff. And eventually, if we are becoming too old, there is some somebody can produce on the market life extension technology. But eventually, the universe is going to die. So uh, time is uh, so, uh, the limited of time is supply. It, uh, the, limited, the, the supply of time is limited. And we will touch each of one. We realistically touch this this limit. We already do now, like now my, my supply of time that I have for this presentation is probably not enough to finish meaningfully my discussion. But anyway, I will try. So there is another kind of things that is very, uh, that is actually limited in a practical sense, which is free energy. We usually talk about energy like, like uh, uh, you know, we are consuming energy. We used to use uh, renewable sources because you're running out of oil. We are running out of fossils. We are consuming these, we are consuming that. This is actually not true because energy doesn't get consumed. Energy doesn't just, just transfers from one thing to the other. So you cannot waste energy. Energy is always there, physically speaking. What you can waste is free energy, which is basically what we can, we can call low entropy energy. So if we burn wood to make heat, we can do that. But we cannot actually leave uh, smoke to, to cool down to get some wood. So it doesn't work at the reverse. Uh, entropy, the second law of thermodynamics says that entropy always increases. So when we have some kind of energy at low entropy, when we consume it, we will never have it again. We are just destroying it. So what, are actually, what we are consuming when we talk about uh, uh, renewable sources and oil and everything is not actually oil. I mean, oil is irrelevant. If we run out of oil, we can, if we have enough energy, we can create atoms of oil one by one inside the lab. The point that we don't do that because it's super complex and super expensive. But if it was needed, we could do that in principle. So the only thing that is scarce is not oil, but it's actually low entropy. So there is still, there is a lot of low entropy though, because in order to run out of low entropy in our planet, we will probably have to create, you know, the Dyson sphere around the sun, consuming all the energy of all the atomic uh, nucleus in the planet. And then maybe we run out of low entropy. And low entropy, uh, I don't want to get too much into depth about this, but low entropy, paradoxically enough, before we say that information uh, is, imp is relevant because it's not scarce, because you can reproduce it, but actually low entropy in a physical sense can be called information but this is a, in a strange use a very particular use of the word information another example actually can be bitcoin the the reason of bitcoin may be one of the very few things that are actually scarce in a practical sense together with time free energy low entropy and information is that bitcoin is basically produced consuming free energy so the proof of work mechanism of production uh, links bitcoin with free energy uh, or low entropy in a very uh, direct way using uh, uh, ash collision and proof of, proof of work. So there is a link here. Just to uh, just to give you a few examples of this discussion, I googled a little bit uh, uh, if any economist ever tried to de define scarcity 
with uh, low entropy or with free energy. And I found some stuff. I, I don't know how good these books are. Actually, I just read a few chapters. But on Google Books, I found this uh, uh, natural economic science or writing economic fundamentals uh, by this uh, uh, Mr. or Dr. Uh, Fudulu, and he discusses basically low entropy as the origin, economic origin of scarcity. And then you can find uh, uh, from catastrophe to chaos, a general theory of economic discontinuity. And you can find basically a uh, discussion about low entropy being the, the main point of uh, the main origin of, uh, of scarcity on the actual practical world. Uh, world. And then you have this like an entropy theory of value by uh, by Jing Chen. So I found some stuff in the in the recent days, but I think you can find something most related to Bitcoin, which is very very good article by uh, Robert Bridlow. And uh, Robert uh, basically uh, this article is called Bitcoin and the Tyranny of Time Scarcity, and it goes back to my point and to the point that many people have done also Saifedian. Uh, somewhere in the in the Bitcoin standard, um, there is this point that time is the only scarce commodity. I would say that it, it's true, but also low entropy is another is is another way of of, of uh, putting it. And Bitcoin is closely related with low entropy. So there is a practical scarcity, which is that which is which is just basically this. So let's try to go to a little bit more rigorous definition because we have seen that with a very naive definition, so something with limited supply, basically everything is scarce, even numbers. The numbers that you can write down in the universe, they are scarce, there is a limited supply. And everything is not scarce, meaning that eventually we will have uh, more of everything if we want, including something like free energy. I mean, free energy is scarce, but if we need more free energy, we just start doing uh, uh, uh annihilation of we can just extract energy from uh, nucleus of uranium and we can uh, fire up the the whole world for i mean we just create a dozen sphere around the sound and and we have a lot of free energy for a lot of time so it's not really practically scarce uh the 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 the, the definition the rigorous definition basically uh came came down to two uh different uh, uh sub definition one is relative scarcity Relative scarcity is basically whatever has a demand supply ratio which is high enough to generate to generate a price. I forgot to close the double quote, but anyway, uh, the point is that uh, air, uh, oxygen on Earth is not scarce because yes, there is a lot of demand for oxygen because we want to breathe, but there is more supply than demand, and so nobody is selling oxygen on, on planet Earth because there is more than than there is demand. So uh, it's not a scarce good because, yeah, there is a finite amount physically of oxygen in the atmosphere, but there is not enough supply to generate, to, uh, sorry, enough demand to generate, to generate a price at that supply. Of course, if you remember the movie, the beautiful movie, Total Recall, with the great uh, actor Ern Arnold Schwarzenegger, you will, rem you, will, you will recall, yeah, that basically there, is, uh, there are merchants selling and buying oxygen on Mars, because on Mars, oxygen is actually scarce. The supply of oxygen of, on Mars is not zero, but is lower than the demand. And so there is scarcity, and so there is an economic relationship, relationship developing around it. On the planet Earth, for now, uh, it's, it's not really scarce. If you are on, on Mount Everest and you need, a, a, and you need a, to breathe, and you're out of your uh, oxygen supply, and then you steal or you buy your oxygen supply from your Sherpa guide. In that case, uh, oxygen is scarce. Same goes for water. Like uh, uh, water in the in the Great Lake uh, region is not scarce. Water in the middle of the Sahara is an economic good because it has scarcity. So relative scarcity basically it's a good definition. It's a consistent definition. This is the definition, for example, that we fight about with, when we discuss with uh, with Eric Boswell because this is the uh, traditional economic definition of scarcity. Whatever has a demand which is uh, not enough to satisfy, sorry, a, a supply which is not enough to, to satisfy all the demand, and so you basically produce a price. So in this sense, every single economic good, every single example of property uh, is scarce. So Bitcoin is not more scarce than toilet paper or than gold or than anything, including water in the Sahara or water in the in some deserts of uh, of North America. 
So everything is scarce economically. Every, no, not everything. Everything which has a price in a market is relatively scarce in that market. The problem with this definition is that it is consistent. It is good. It is the right definition in the traditional economic history, but it's not very uh, interesting, especially for uh, to to explain the difference. I mean, there is a difference between Bitcoin. There is a difference between gold and water, and there is a difference between Bitcoin and gold. And this difference is not really well detected by this definition of relative scarcity because uh, cigarettes in a, uh, are, are the same as toilet paper, which is the same as gold, which is the same as bitcoins. While absolute scarcity is actually, uh, we can give two different definitions of absolute scarcity. The first is a little bit, uh, um, it's not very well defined, I think, but we could say that something is absolutely scarce when the price uh, I mean, it has a price, so there is a demand supply ratio that justifies the emergence of a price. There is more people wanting it than than supply, and the price is so high that uh, well, I wrote that anybody, uh, uh, my my bad. I wanted to write that nobody could actually pay for it. So when the price of a good is so high that nobody can pay for it, which means that only the the uh, the current uh, the current owner will never sell it, we'll just consume it because the price would be too high to even find somebody with enough wealth to, to buy it. Maybe we can argue that this can be some kind of definition of, uh, of, uh, of absolute scarcity, but it's a bad definition. The better definition actually has to do with the inelastic change in supply with respect to demand. So when, when, you, have scar when you have relative scarcity, but this relative scarcity changes because the, uh, basically the demand goes up, but the supply cannot go up uh, together with the demand. Uh, or in the other way around, the demand goes down, but the supply remains up. In this case, you have an absolute ab ab abundance because maybe you, you have the price going down and down and eventually to zero because we increase the supply. We we find a way to, for example, at the end of Total Recall, I don't want to spoil you the movie, the, spoiler you the movie, but at the end, there is oxygen for everybody. And so, uh, there is there is a lot of supply compared to the demand and the price eventually goes to zero. And so everybody can just take oxygen without stealing and without uh, buying, purchasing oxygen. So this second definition is very interesting because it doesn't really relate with the equilibrium price and the equilibrium of demand and supply, like relative scarcity. Relative scarce is anything that has a price. Absolute scarce in this sense is anything where the supply cannot grow enough to uh, meet the, I mean, the growth in the supply rate uh, change is not uh, uh, as, as, as big as the, the growth in the demand uh, r change rate. So uh, a, a good example is, for example, in the short term, we have uh, the example of shortages. For if we have uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, hysteria, in the United States and elsewhere, we have a shortage of respirators. It's not that respirators are are infinitely uh, are absolutely scarce, meaning that you cannot produce uh, more uh, respirators. You can produce how many respirators you want in theory. The problem is that the demand of respirators went up so much that there was not actually uh, a possible supply change. The supply change of respirators was lower to catch up than the rise in the demand. And so we have a shortage of respirators. And the same, a little bit more funny maybe, but we, we, we have seen the same with toilet paper. During the COVID-19 uh, hysteria, people, uh, I mean, hospital, where they were short, they, they thought they were short on respirators and, uh, and people thought they were short on toilet paper for some reason. In that moment, toilet paper, toilet paper became uh, absolute, absolute scarce, but for a while, only short term. This usually, last longer, these uh, shortage phenomena, they last longer when you have uh, uh, basically state uh, intervention in uh, uh, regulation uh, or price control. So in Venezuela, uh, toilet paper was scarce and it's still scarce. Uh, there is still shortage because there is socialism. So everything is, is basically absolute scarce because uh, the price control uh, in inhibits, in, in, in inhibits the mechanism of uh, supply regulation. And so the demand uh, remains very, very high and the supply never arrives. And the same with food uh, under socialism and basically everything under socialism. And so there is, there is short term uh, uh, absolute scarcity and there is long term absolute scarcity. 
which is funny because if you if you if you look for some good some property some economic good that that becomes absolutely scarce because the demand goes up faster than the supply and then remains like that forever uh with very good guarantees of always remaining like that well i can think about uh, satoshis so the fraction of bitcoins and well not much except for this very very high level uh information or neg or a uh, uh, low entropy uh, uh super scarce um uh, physical feature of the universe but uh, while information or low end in a physical sense or low entropy they are only absolutely scarce in a in in a in a time frame that is like a galactic civilization time frame where we just run out of stars in the galaxy and so we have a problem of shortage uh which is long term uh in the case of satoshis this this problem of shortage basically arises already in uh, basically in a few years from now so it's it's a little bit more relevant and more consequential and more important so in this definition uh bitcoin is actually i, I come back to the uh to the definition of cyphedian inside the bitcoin standard i think there are good definition we can actually debate we can be a little bit more uh, obnoxious we can actually be annoying and uh, about a few a few a few pre, uh, precise uh nuances and uh, and clarifications but i think that the general point made by cyphedian is kind of strong so bitcoin is not the only or first example of relative scarcity in information realm because uh, secrets are already scarce but they are ephemeral they they cannot make a good form of money because uh, you can exchange a secret actually not exchange you can inflate the secret telling the secret for, to somebody else and after a few hopes the secret is basically completely common so you lose control of the scarcity of the secret very very soon so the you can trade secrets but just for a while then they become worthless very very soon you cannot have money based on secret actually in bitcoin you need a secret to move your money but uh, you only need it until you transfer it then you don't need it anymore so in uh, uh, you, you already have digital scarcity uh, relative scarcity in economical sense but ephemeral in secrets and uh, and it is basically also ephemeral and also very destructive in uh, in a government uh, art, uh, government created a violence uh, violence based um, uh, uh, scarcity like patents or copyrights where you need somebody which will go to hurt somebody else if he shares an information that he didn't even subscribe any contract to keep secret so this is not the same of uh, industrial secrets this is copyright copyright means that if you come under my house and you whistle a song I and if I hear the song I didn't sign any contract with you I decide to whistle the song back and you send somebody to hurt me because I did that this is a negative sum process that destroys economic resources like any kind of uh, violent non-voluntary intervention so uh bitcoin is not the only but is the best example of sustainable long term uh, relative scarcity in the information realm quite just like cyphedian said and this, it is the only example of long term absolute scarcity because you can have absolute scarcity of toilet paper or respirator for a short term but then eventually the supply uh, structure will uh, increase the supply and will meet the demand but with bitcoin you can't why because you have the fundamental property of bitcoin which is basically difficulty adjustment plus also the halving but especially difficulty adjustment so even if uh, the price goes up and there is more incentive to do mining uh the hash rate will go up but then the the, the difficulty will adjust and so you will have the same rate of supply which is basically uh 6.25 bitcoin every 10 minutes for four years and then half and then half and then half and this you can you can tweak a little bit because for example if there is a, if the price goes up for for the next years they probably the, the time interval will be a little less than four years and if the price doesn't goes up doesn't go up the time interval will, will be a little bit more than four years but essentially the average is four years and you cannot go i mean you cannot significantly change it so this is what uh, cyphedian clarified a lot uh talking about stock to flow ratio 
I think that most of you are already familiar by now with this meme. Uh, there is a lot of debate about uh, prediction of the price uh, due to uh, stock to flow. But the stock to flow just means you take the stock of Bitcoin. So how many Bitcoins are there in circulation? And you take the flow. So how many Bitcoins are produced every year? And then you create the ratio of this. And the, this kind of stock to flow ratio is actually immutable. It's going high and high higher and higher in Bitcoin with the halving and cannot be made lower in no realistic scenario except the total failure of Bitcoin itself. While uh, with gold, uh, the, the, the stock to flow ratio is actually good because it's like uh, 100 or something like that. That means that every year the amount of gold extracted compared to the amount of gold already in the economy is actually uh, basically 1%, sometimes it's 2%. But this is good because it means that if the price of, of gold goes up 2x, then the incentives for to mine will go up 2x. Then with a lot, not immediately, with a lot of time and a lot of effort, the production of gold will uh, gold will go from 1% to 2%. But it will not go to 200%. So the, the sub total supply will not go from 100 to 200. It, it will just go from 100 to 102 instead of 101. So it's, it's a very good inelasticity of supply uh, with regard to demand. With Bitcoin, it's even better because uh, basically there is no way you can increase the supply rate even if the demand increases. So this is the only example of long-term absolute scarcity, except, of course, for uh, this very philosophical, but also very realistic, but more philosophical concept of time and free energy and information. So free energy and information, there is so much that we will not run out of it uh, until we create a giant Dyson sphere uh, around the sun. So there is a lot of time for that. And uh, time will not, uh, will not go away until we die. And we will die eventually. But we, you can try, you can hope to extend uh, your lifetime with some weird uh, experiments for a while. Uh, but then eventually you will die anyway because the universe will just uh, entropically die. So uh, there is no hope in... Uh, I mean, I'm sorry for transhumanists and extropians, but you will die anyway, because eventually the universe will just entropy, uh, entropically die. But uh, your time is uh, absolutely scarce. But except for time in your life, uh, long uh, uh, Bitcoin Satoshis are also absolutely scarce. There is a difference. You don't know how much time is left on your life. I mean, most of us, we don't know. Uh, we hope some, but we don't know. Uh, we exactly know how many Satoshi can be produced uh, if the, if Bitcoin doesn't fail. Uh, of course, this is assuming that the incentives of Bitcoin, the social incentives are strong enough to keep the production rate uh, absolutely unchanged. If Bitcoin is ever going to change the supply uh, rate, change the supply change rate, I think that Bitcoin will lose completely this kind of, uh, of feature. And in that, in that scenario, Bitcoin, in my opinion, will lose basically any interesting feature, feature because it will prove to be not resistant to any kind of social pressure. So eventually, if you can do inflation in Bitcoin, eventually you can do KYC in Bitcoin as well. Uh, it, it just proved to be not resistant to, uh, to political pressure and to cultural pressure. But I, do, I don't think this is realistic, actually. And I think that Bitcoin is a good example of long-term absolute scarcity.